Hi, everybody. This is Robert Hodges, and I'll be your host today at our Alternity webinar on more secrets of ClickHouse query performance. Before we dive into the webinar content, I'd first of all like to welcome you all. This is a very popular topic, and uh, we hope to see many of you here today. There are already um, something like 50 or 60 people on the on the call. Um, for to make things uh, more convenient for you, we are recording this webinar. We will also publish the slides afterwards, so you don't have to frantically take notes. You'll get a link that will direct you to both of them uh, within about a day. One other thing, or actually two other points. Uh, this is a complex topic. We know that people are here with questions, so there is a Q&A that, uh, that you can, where you can enter questions. And we will answer them as we go along, and also there will be time at the end to dig into them as well. So if you don't get a question, typically um, we'll sort of answer them in the background as we go along. Sometimes I'll do them in the, in the talk as, as well. So our idea is to try and answer as many of them as possible. And uh, finally, at the end, we will also run a poll. We do this after all of our webinars, three simple questions. It's just a little bit of information that helps us tune these webinars and make sure that we're making them, uh, that, uh, that they're sort of hitting the mark and also giving us idea f ideas for future webinars. With that, I'd like to dive in. And if I can get my screens to advance. Here we go. Brief intro. So my name is Robert Hodges. I'm Altenity's CEO. I've um, been working on databases since 1983, and ClickHouse is, is database number 20. I, I like data. I also have with me today, I don't have a picture, but Alexander Zaitsev has joined us. He is our CTO. He'll be in the background answering questions, and will come on live at the end um, uh, to answer questions as well. So you'll probably get uh, uh, learned answers to your questions uh, in the in the question box as the uh, as the webinar is going along. Just a little bit about Altenity. We're the leading software and services provider for ClickHouse. We make basically our goal is to make enterprises successful at building analytic applications using ClickHouse. We have a large number of customers ranging from tiny startups to some enormous uh, Fortune. Uh, in fact, some of the Fortune 10 uh, companies. And we're also uh, relevant to this conversation. We're a major committer and community sponsor in the U.S. and Western Europe. We do a lot of work with the community. Um, we also do quite a bit of, of uh, development. And in fact, in this webinar, we will be talking about some features that, Ale that, that Alexander's team developed for ClickHouse, and then um, which are now available in community releases. So that's all the introduction that we need to do. What I'd like to now do is dive into the talk, and let's talk a little bit about goals. So we're here to talk about performance on single node uh, ClickHouse uh, uh, servers. So we'll be focusing on the merge tree data structure. So that's the workhorse data structure for tables in ClickHouse. We'll be delving into what that structure actually, how that uh, structure is actually organized. And we're going to be looking at three general topics. First, to improve your responses, right, query response time by tuning the SQL. The second is to get very large gains by changing data layout. And then the third, which is new, is to um, increase the performance by changing the allocation of storage, the, the arrangement of disks, and thinking, beginning to think a little bit about how uh, the OS page cache is used. Uh, as well. So this is a new section. We previously did this talk, but this is something that has actually been added to ClickHouse since we first did this talk last September, and we're happy to talk about it today. Some things we won't be trying to do, um, boost performance of sharded and replicated clusters, so in other words, distributed uh, ClickHouse clusters. We have a webinar that delves into that topic. It's a complex topic in its own right, and we can't do uh, we, we, we would not be able to cover it here. So feel free to check out that webinar. It's also in the, given in the references, uh, but it's, it's recorded and available for your um, listening pleasure. And a final thing we won't do is teach very advanced ClickHouse uh, performance management. So for example, you can go into the code. You can look at what uh, ClickHouse is doing deep in the operating system, get additional insights about how to make things uh, run fast. That is something that other talks cover. It's out of scope for this presentation. That said, I think you'll find this, even if you're an expert, sufficiently technical that you'll learn lots of useful stuff. 
let's start with that useful stuff. I'm going to dive in and talk a little bit about ClickHouse just as a level set, but then particularly focus on how Merge Tree is organized. So if you are new to ClickHouse, well, first of all, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you in the community. Uh, here's just an overview of, of, of what ClickHouse is and why people like it. The way I like to explain this, and I think some of you have probably heard this before, is imagine if MySQL, the popular open source relational database, got married to Vertica, a pioneering column store, and they had a baby. Well, the result would be ClickHouse. Uh, good things from both parents. So on both sides, understand SQL. So this is a, we're talking SQL uh, data are organized into tables. Um, highly portable, that's a, a legacy, well not a legacy, but sort of a property of MySQL. So everything from bare metal to the cloud and the containers. Um, from, the, from MySQL, we also get, of course, the open source. Uh, ClickHouse is licensed with Apache 2.0, which has very few restrictions on use. And um, it's also relatively easy to manage. Now, from the Vertica side of the house, some of the similarities that we have are, first of all, a shared nothing architecture. So compute and storage are bound together on nodes, which are then built into a cluster. Um, we store the data in columns with compression and codecs. That's something we'll be focusing on in this talk. We are do parallel and vectorized uh, execution, so parallel across nodes, vectorized in, on single nodes to ensure that we milk the maximum amount of performance out of the CPUs, so all hardware threads will be used if, if it is possible to do so, and um, there's a fair amount of SIMD optimization so that we're not only using all threads but also trying to use uh, leverage uh, the instruction set on the CPU. And then finally, um, sort of from the uh, data warehouse side, uh, ClickHouse scales to many petabytes. It runs on this uh, machines as simple as this six-year-old Dell laptop that I am running this webinar on, all the way up to clusters that contain hundreds of nodes and tens of petabytes of data. The thing that really attracts people, though, more than anything else, is it's fast. So the columnar storage, um, the fact that everything's a sequential read or sequential write, and just a wealth of performance optimizations as well as features are what really grabs people's attention. And that's, in fact, what we're going to be talking about today is how to make it even faster. So the first step is to understand the basic table type here, which is called merge tree. It's uh, – and, and – um, the, the name is sort of similar to uh, log structured merge tree. That's a, uh, a famous data structure uh, introduced by O'Neill about 30 years ago. And the basic idea with a merge tree is that it will accept data very quickly and put it into, um, put it into storage. And then in the background, it will systematically merge it into a form that makes queries more efficient. So the idea is that when you insert your data, it's immediately queryable, but not necessarily as efficient as it could be. Over time, it becomes merged to a much more efficient structure, which will minimize, for example, the number of files that have to be open, the uh, run length of, of compression, um, things like that. Here's the definition of a merge tree. It's pretty simple. So if uh, for most of the people on this call, you've seen these before. You do a create table, and then you give a table engine type, merge tree or one of the variants. There's um, a number of them, something like 12, depending on how you count, um, at least. And um, then there's two very important properties in the definition. One is partition by, and this tells us how to, do, how to break up the table into parts. And we'll look at what, a part, what parts are in just a second. Um, the second thing is order by, which tells you the sort order. There are also um, settings that you can give. That's another clause, subclause. We don't show that here, but we'll show examples of that later on. They allow you to tune the performance of the table for specific use cases. So that's the basic definition. Let's have a look at what's going on under the covers when you actually lay out a merge tree. So at a high level, sort of a architecture picture, the table is divided up into parts. These are independently stored and um, indexed and sorted um, pieces of the table. And if you look into a part, you'll see an index. It's called um, uh, primary.idx and uh, a bunch of columns. And we'll, look at the, we'll study the columns in, in just a minute. But the basic idea is the, the index is sparse. 
So it's not like a bee tree index. Um, it's a it's a very very um, uh, simple data structure that basically has an entry on on average for or by default for every 8,000 or so rows, and then the columns are stored as arrays of data which are compressed and also sorted using that order by that uh, was given in the table definition. So that's the high-level organization. What we want to do now is actually dig in and look deeply at the, what's going on underneath. So um, what we have here is the actual structure that you'll see if you go into the directory that is, is storing a merge tree. Uh, so what you'll see here is, first of all, this primary.idx file. That's your sparse index. And then for every column, you'll see a file called .mrk and a file called .bin. So the way that this works is the primary.idx uh, file, this, this sparse index, contains an entry by default for every 8,196 uh, entries. The distance between two entries is called a granule. So that's um, about 8,000 rows. Then these .mrk files are, are what we call, uh, contain what we call marks. And these are basically pointers that will say, given, a, uh, given like granule number three, where do I start reading in the .bin file? And that .bin file is a bunch of compressed blocks that we can, so you know, if you have the mark, you, you go in there, that gives you a pointer, an offset basically into the bin file, and then you, can, uh, you know where to start reading. So what this does is if once we find, for example, this row that is highlighted in the primary .idx, .idx if we know that we want to read from the airline table, we can go ahead and um, actually find the place to begin reading the data. So that's the basic structure. One of the cool things about ClickHouse is that the file structure is very transparent. This is the actual Linux uh, directory name for this particular uh, table. If I go in, I can actually see the part, which is then named, showing um, uh, in a way that gives us a sense of the data that it contains. Uh, so you can go in and just see all this stuff for yourself if you're curious. Okay, um, so that's the basic structure. And what we're now going to do is dive in and look a little bit at, at some basic query tuning. And by the way, if you have questions as, uh, as you're going along, please feel free to, open, to go ahead and uh, just queue them up in the question and answer box, and we'll answer them in the background as the webinar is going on. So let's turn to basic query tuning. Before we actually look at some queries, um, I'd like to just give you kind of an overview. So if you're coming here from Oracle, or you're coming here from another, um, uh, you know, sort of a proprietary data warehouse, what you're going to find is that things are pretty different. So there's some bad news, and the first bit of bad news is there's no query optimizer. So, and by that I mean something that can evaluate the distribution of data, figure out the cost of queries, and devise a plan with that by magic that will basically get that data in an efficient way, or in the, in you know, sort of something close to an efficient way. So not only is there no query optimizer, there's no explain plan command. So if you're used to, to using explain plan to get a sense of what the, what the optimizer might do, you won't find that in ClickHouse either. And then a final thing, which is, is, is really important and significant in design, is that often getting good performance requires you to move data around. If you've been in the database business for a long time, you know that the secret to performance is the distribution of your data in storage. This is the fundamental way that we get uh, queries to run fast is by distributing the data in a way that's well suited for the questions that we're answering. So what that means with ClickHouse is that by the time you find out what is the right distribution, you may have accumulated a petabyte of data, so you may have to do a little bit of work to move things around to get the best performance. So this is something that that comes up and you need to think about. On the other hand, there's some really great news. I think the fact there's no query optimizer is actually good uh, because what ClickHouse does, ClickHouse is very transparent. So you will see that it is, it, you'll basically, uh, it's sort of what you see is what you get and you'll see examples of that. The system log, which we're going to look at in just a second, is awesome. It gives you really great information about what ClickHouse thinks it's doing to, to get queries and you can use that to, to figure out how to organize data, how to tune queries, and, um, and get better performance. ClickHouse also has the best system tables of any database I've ever used. It, they're, they're incredibly useful, and they are particularly well-structured for answering problems about, about performance. 
performance drivers, so what makes ClickHouse go fast is really simple. Um, it, at the bottom level, it is fundamentally how much I.O. do you do and how many CPUs can you apply to it. Other things like bandwidth on your um, storage devices are, of course, important. We'll talk about those as well. And then finally, ClickHouse is constantly improving. So we're talking in this, since September, the notion of um, what's called storage policies uh, arrived in ClickHouse and is, is now at, at production grade, but there's a host of other improvements as well. So it, it, you're, there's constantly new optimizations as well as features that you can use for queries. So the ClickHouse query log is exceedingly helpful when we dive in to start looking at query performance. And so um, here are some examples of how you can invoke it. So this is, um, we can use ClickHouse uh, client. Uh, we can uh, select it from um, uh, the text log, which you can enable and config.ssl. You can also go and look at the, at the log as well, um, which is the normal thing that you do in databases. So for example, at Oracle, you go look at traces to, to figure out what it's up to. Um, what I'd like to do is just, the log is so useful, I'd like to just do a short demo. Let me see if I can get this to stop for a second. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, just show you how this works, because this is something we're going to lean on for the rest of this presentation. So what I've done is fired up ClickHouse Client. I'm running a, on a single node up in Amazon. Let me go ahead and um, just pull up, clear my screen a little bit here. I'm going to go ahead and let's use a database here. So pick a database to use. Uh, there's the name. I'm going to run a query. and. Uh, so here we go. There's the query. It ran. It was pretty quick. But what did it actually do? Now, <clears throat> one of the really cool features uh, about the ClickHouse client is we can actually turn on logging and get the, the system log for that query sent back to us along with our results. This is incredibly useful for debugging because it means you don't have to figure out where this server is um, or have access to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this property, send logs level. We're going to set it to trace. That's going to give us sort of low-level information about what ClickHouse is up to. Let's run that query again. In fact, we can just go ahead and bring it up. There we go. And so we got the results. They're right here in the middle of the screen I'm showing. But what we also got was a huge amount of useful information, which tells, first of all, okay, here's the query that ClickHouse saw. Here's um, as you know, some things like how many parts did it read, we'll, um, we'll dig into that. Uh, how many rows did it read? Um, what was the query, um, the, you know, sort of the, uh, the structure of the, of the query plan that it arrived at? Uh, we'll talk about that. And then finally, uh, a bunch of really useful, for the individual threads, um, which are used, used to collect I.O., we can see in some detail how much did they actually read and how quickly did they do it. So this is extraordinarily useful information. And what this is going to sh give us, uh, enable us to do, is learn a lot about what's happening under the covers, how much did ClickHouse read, how quickly was it able to do it, and we can use that to, turn, to tune the queries. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and turn that, that logging off because that'll set me up for a future demo. Um, and now, at this point, we're back to normal, but you've seen the log, and it's something you can turn on, turn off, at will to figure out what's going on. So let's go back to the slides and, and start um, figuring out how to use this. So let's make it big again. All right, so there's the log. So first thing to look at in the log and is to go and look at this, um, this hierarchy that you get, which is basically your query plan. And this is an example of a query uh, shown up in the, uh, the left-hand side. It's on a, one of our favorite pet data site, uh, sets, which is airline on-time data. And uh, what results in the log is, is what we call a query pipeline. These pipelines are sort of hard to interpret. They're not this, exactly the same as a query plan in the sense that you're used to it in an explain plan. What they're really showing you is sort of what was the hierarchy of the C++ classes that were implementing the query. But you can still get a lot of useful information out of it. So for example, one of the things that, that you can go look at is down at the bottom, you can see this expression times eight. That means there were eight parallel threads reading the table. So that's already useful information because you can tell what your level of parallelization is. Depending on how well you know the code, you can get more or less information about what's going on further up the tree. So this 
this gives you some some initial um, information. And in fact, <clears throat> what it suggests is that one of the first ways that we can speed up query ex execution is just to add more CPU to it. So um, there's a very useful property called max threads that uh, you can use, and that basically will set the number of hardware threads um, to, that are enabled to, to process the query. So basically, if you're using, if you look at, um, at PROC vCPU, or um, um, at, uh, at PROC CPU, the, however many CPUs you have in there, that's the number of threads that ClickHouse has. By default, it will give you half of them for the query, but then you can change it yourself, either by setting it on the command line, as I did right here, or you can actually set it in user profiles so that particular users can get more threads um, or, or fewer threads, depending on what they're doing. And here's an example of the effect. So this graph over on the right side shows the effect on this particular query and the response we get as we vary the threads from two to eight. And so what you see is going from two to four threads, we pretty much get, um, a, we get a 50% improvement, so a lot of parallelization in there. Um, and then beyond that, it sort of asymptotically falls off. And what you're seeing is in the query process, and there are some Amdahl effects, as we're in this particular case, we're doing a, um, a group by an assort. So we're going to have to do some aggregation and sorting at the end to make sure that everything is, um, uh, you know, is, is working. That's single threaded for the most part. And so you don't see so, uh, so many effects. So this is one of your first ways to speed up queries, but there are many others. So the, really the number one way to speed up a query is not so much CPU, but to reduce the amount of data that you read. And so this is, we have an example of, of this here, where what we're going to do is run a query, um, which is reading a large amount of data, run a similar query, but with a filter condition, and then compare the amount of data that's read. This is obviously a very simple case. Um, uh, just adding a where clause is something that would probably occur to, to just about anybody. But the interesting thing is that the ClickHouse log gives you very detailed information about what the effect is. So for example, in this query on the left, we selected 355 parts. Those are those big chunks of the table. Moreover, within those parts, we read to, uh, 21,393 marks. So those are, remember, all the, the chunks inside the arrays of data. So this is telling us that we read quite a bit of data. As it turns out, this particular table has 355 parts, so we read all of them, and it has this many marks. We read all of those as well, at least for the columns we were looking at. When we put the filter condition in, what we now see is that the, um, the ClickHouse selected a much smaller number of marks, Moreover, it, um, excuse me, a much smaller number of parts, and then it uh, was able to read from um, a, a much smaller number of marks as a result. So ClickHouse clearly shows when you think you're changing something, if you think it's going to help with I.O., you can usually go in and tell pretty quickly. Not a, you don't just have to depend on speed, but you can actually look in the query log, and ClickHouse will tell you exactly how many marks it read. So this is super useful. It also illustrates one of the optimizations that ClickHouse is pretty efficient at figuring out um, <clears throat> whether, um, for example, in the filter conditions, uh, it will, wherever possible, avoid even looking into the parts. If it can figure out from the partition key that it, there are, uh, you know, because it knows what the partition key is, if it can match your filter to the partition key, it won't even open partitions that it doesn't need to look at. So this is a great way to, to speed up queries. And in fact, um, at the base level for simple queries, the execution will scale directly with I.O. And here's an example. I'm going to uh, change that query just a little bit, add more filter conditions uh, in the example. And what we can see is that the query response in this graph on the right is in seconds. The marks that it reads is on the, um, is on the right side. And these are one-to-one particularly in a query like this, which doesn't have complex uh, aggregation, it's just one for one with the amount of, uh, the number of marks that you read. Those lines are basically almost the same. So, so this is uh, the CPU and the, you know, between CPU and, and uh, IO, these are two really great ways to, to quickly get in and speed up your queries without actually having to change data underneath. There are other things though that you can do. 
So one of the interesting features that ClickHouse has is something called pre-where. So a where clause in SQL is a filter. When you, but ClickHouse has a special syntax called pre-where, and what that means is if you use it, what it will do is it will actually go ahead and scan that column. If it's, even if it's not in the primary.idx, it will scan that column and basically use it as, a, as an ad hoc index. So it'll run down that column, keep track of all the marks that it read, and then it will only read those marks in, uh, when it goes to the other columns. So it's basically an index without an index. And the feature actually dates from the days before ClickHouse had skip indexes, which is a feature we'll talk about in just a minute. So you can see the effect of this. So um, you see the, um, let's see, so log messages, the difference between, uh, so pre-where is here on the left. It took uh, 0.6 seconds and it took 0.8, and you can see the difference in the amount of data that it processed. One interesting thing about pre-where is it kicks in automatically. So this is something you should know about when you're tuning queries. It used to be that you would um, set this property, optimize move to pre-where, uh, but now the default is one, so it will do it automatically. And what you will see in the log is that, in fact, without you, even though you had a normal wear condition, ClickHouse will just automatically move it to pre-wear. And um, so, what you can do is, if you don't like this, you can use that uh, you can use that filter that that setting to shut it off. <clears throat> so. Um, then final thing is uh, restructuring joins. Obviously, that's something you can do in any database. It's uh, particularly effective in ClickHouse, but one of the ways that the, one of the most effective uh, ways that you can restructure is uh, just one second. Sorry, I had to sneeze. Um, the, uh, we can restructure joins to to reduce the scanning, but when you think about restructuring joins um, in a database with a full query optimizer, that often means reordering them or you know, playing around with different join types. In ClickHouse, a particularly powerful form of restructuring is to reduce the amount of base data that you read and are then dragging around for the rest of the query. So here's an example. We do a join on this, this uh, on-time data against a table that gives us airports and turns our airport codes into a nice name. Um, so Query up above does the join. This will get pushed down, and um, basically the data will be um, all read in the lowest level. That's the parallelized level. What we can do is we can improve this enormously by a factor of almost four by taking that join and uh, pulling it out. So basically what we'll do is we'll select from a subquery, which then gets joined on airports. So what's really happening here is that the airports are being joined against the aggregated data. So, um, <clears throat> and you can see this happening in the log. It, uh, again, this is just an example of how useful the log can be. If we do the join during the merge tree scan, we can see that we went and ended up scanning about 10, uh, uh, about 10 gigs of data. Um, if we do it after the scan, then the initial scan only uh, covered about 2.6 gigs. So uh, this is a very powerful way. Again, reducing I/O is is critical to performance. So uh, the, the more we reduce it, the better the better the queries run. There are lots more ways to find out about queries. Um, one thing I'll point out is the query log, which is the first of a number of really useful system tables that we'll mention today. Uh, you can turn that on, and then you'll you can basically have the queries automatically logged, and then this logs a bunch of information. Not quite as much as we get in the system log, but it will um, give you information that you can then query to get, uh, to get more insight into uh, what your queries are doing, particularly if you have a lot of them. So the next thing we want to do is talk about optimizing data layout. So queries are, uh, query, tuning the queries is something you do if you can't change the data. You have something that's not uh, not working well. It's your first step, particularly if you don't have access to the to the database itself. But if you do have access to the database and you have the freedom to restructure your data, you can now get enormous performance uh, benefits, often uh, often um, many orders of magnitude. So let's go in and um, and have a look at that. We're going to talk about a bunch of different techniques. 
ranging from ensuring that we've got the optimal number of parts to um, using skip indexes to using materialized views. Um, rather than read this slide, let's just dive in and look at some of them. So uh, one key question to ask, and this this comes uh, this comes up um, actually in our support cases, is does that partition by affect performance? So here's an example. I have this on timetable. I there's a key the, uh, the or column that we use uh, called flight date. We can partition by turning it into a month, so all 30 days will be in the part, or we could partition or partition by the day. Does this make a practical difference? So if you've watched our webinars before, we rarely ask, ask questions like that unless the answer is yes, and the difference is big. So here's a good example. So what I did was I actually compared these two, loaded the data in. I had an on-time many parts, which partitioned by flight date, um, and the uh, partition by the month, so uh, on flight date. And what we see over on the right is the difference is a full order of magnitude between when we do a uh, select count. And by the way, this is an older version where we actually had to look at the uh, at the at the at the data. This is in newer versions. You probably wouldn't see this. Um, but basically, it would go from uh, 0.34 to 3.2. So because we were basically scanning a bunch of parts. So. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, and as I say, I think the performance has changed in recent versions. But the point is that reading parts is expensive, and what's in fact, um, and when you do the insert, we in this particular case we got a very large number of parts, actually about fourteen thousand in this on time many parts table. And then what I did was ran a uh, an optimized table command to merge the parts and reduce it down to about ten thousand, and that reduced the the, uh, the the query response time significantly. So generally speaking, you want to keep. It's good to keep parts in the hundreds if you can. If you're in the tens of thousands, you probably get. You probably have a performance problem. Another thing to think about is the primary key index structure. So the um, the order by is uh, there is a prime there is a uh, a primary key clause that you can also use generally speaking most people just define order by that determines the the key by default so thinking about the size of that key because this or the its index structure this needs to fit in memory to work efficiently so um you want to think about how big is that key. So for example, if you had very large strings in that key, sometimes doing a hash on that string is a more efficient way to uh, to build the key structure so that you're not so that you don't have the entire string. Another thing to think about is this this setting called index granularity. That's the num the gap between entries. If that gap is big, it makes the index smaller because of fewer entries. But it turns out that in some cases, if if you uh, want to select, um, if you make the the, uh, the granularity smaller, it can make your skip indexes, which we'll talk about in a minute, much more efficient. It also means that if you're just going for, a, if you have a lot of queries that only really want a single row, making this number smaller can help. So it's a trade-off, and you need to determine it based on your data. So the order by is also key to performance in another way because what it does is it since it determines your sort, if you choose it well, it will make your non-key values less random. And being less random is good because it means you get better compression. It means that your index selectivity is better because you'll have larger runs which have the same value so you can then knock them out and you'll get better uh, pre wear uh, performance for the same reason. So thinking about that order by is really important. This is sometimes one of the biggest ways that you can um, that you can improve performance. Unfortunately, it's it's sometimes not totally obvious until you have a lot of data what's the right way to do it. Um, skip indexes are a really important feature. Somewhat new to ClickHouse, um, there's a there is a um, a setting which is actually now obsolete. I think this may be one that's scheduled for uh, removal. Um, at some point, but basically, um, in older versions, you had to do uh, to set this value, but then that would allow you to add indexes. So they work like secondary indexes in other databases. You know, you alter the table, you add an index, and then there's a bunch of different types like ngram, set. Uh, we'll talk about those. And then, um, in order to to get the indexes to be applied in older releases, uh, you needed to 
uh, run an optimized table. If you already had the um, adding the index did nothing, actually getting the, ta the the index fully implemented required you to do an optimized table. In uh, I believe in current releases, you can just do an alter table uh, update, and this will uh, trick ClickHouse into looking down the parts and adding the index in without having to fully rewrite all the parts. So, um, so this is how you define them. The interesting thing is how they affect performance. So here's the um, <clears throat> here's an example of where we can look at the log and we can see preware helping to move granules. So, for example, we see preware is being applied, and then we can also see that destination name has helped us drop uh, 55 granules in one case and, and uh, uh, 52 in another. So, what the index is doing is we see that the the, the index is helping us skip things, so not read things that uh, that we uh, you know that we don't want to look at. And the effectiveness depends on how your data is distributed. So the idea here is we're knocking things out. If the index is effective at doing that, um, then we're going to have less I/O and we're going to be a lot faster. So here's a simple example: we're selecting a um, um, we're selecting values from a, uh, a data, uh, you know, from a from the airline on timetable. Let's just take an example. We have a set index where we are looking at, okay, what's the carrier name is ML. That's a carrier that is has relatively few rows, so the query response is really fast. We use another query uh, with this in our carrier name with this index. WN is actually Southwest. They actually have about a seventh of the rows in this data set, and the effect is much lower because we actually don't reduce the, the amount of rows that we have to read by very much. It only knocks off about 8 million. So the specificity of the filter is really helpful, the, and the, the rarer the values are, the better these indexes work. Um, just uh, a quick a review of the index types, if you're not familiar with them, min-max, uh, checks the high and low lane, um, uh, uh, range of data, unique values. And these are looking, the, these are basically looking for the presence of the data in the uh, granule. You can actually control the granularity of the index so it scans a larger or smaller uh, um, a group of marks. Uh, we have uh, n-gram, token, uh, bloom filter, and bloom filter. These all work uh, kind of similarly. Uh, so for example, the token bloom filter uh, is basically um, going to look for the help you search on tags and basically avoid looking into marks that don't contain the thing you're looking for. So another thing that you can do at the level of the table is encodings. So ClickHouse by default compresses to um, uh, using LZ4. ZSDD is also supported. Uh, we won't delve into that. Instead, what we'd like to look at, because you can, you can use those and, and uh, ZSDD will give you better compression at the cost of somewhat higher compression uh, processing time. Uh, but one really useful um, uh, feature is encodings, which are basically type-aware transformations on data. So for example, we'll look at three of them. This is a test table. The details are not important, but there's one called low cardinality, which basically uh, turns strings into a dictionary encoding. It works great if you have um, if you have string values in the thousands, so for example, aircraft loca uh, uh, airport locations, that's a great example. There's only a few thousand of them worldwide, so uh, that's a great target for low cardinality. Another um, one here is delta, which basically turns a, a, a series of numbers into the differences between each number. And then double delta, which is instead of differences, it's differences in the slope of the change of those numbers. So we'll see the effect of these uh, because they can be enormous. So for example, if we look at low cardinality encoding in that simple test example I used with some, um, uh, with some uh, 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 ginned up data, I got an 89% re reduction in the storage size for the strings over, um, well, first of all, over the, in, uh, the, the initial size. Um, and, um, and about a 50% improvement over just letting ClickHouse uh, uh, compress it directly. Uh, delta encoding actually can have an enormous impact. 
So, so uh, up to 99 percent, 99.5 percent reduction in this example, and then double delta for things that are slowly increasing or declining can be huge. In this particular case, it reduced the, the ingested data by 99.9 percent once it was compressed. So basically, it goes down to nothing. Moreover, it's not just storage that you're saving; it's queries. So because you're reading less, again, going back to the to the to how ClickHouse works, if you read fewer marks, you're going to go faster, and you actually will see that then in your queries. And in this case, uh, simple example, the um, uh, the query went um, four times faster. Um, a bunch of different encodings. I'm proud to say that we actually contributed to a couple of them. Double Delta and Gorilla come from um, uh, come from Altinity. Uh, but these are very uh, increasingly widely used. Uh, right now, I don't know if they're more in the in the pipeline, but this is definitely an area where this uh, where there's a, a lot of interest in uh, because of the benefit that it it offers. Um, one important thing for as we're looking at this is when you're beginning to play around with encodings, is use the system.columns table. This is another incredibly useful table. Uh, Query is shown here. It will basically show you the level of compression you're getting, and rather th that's this is a second place after query logs. You go to system.columns. You can directly see what were the encodings that were applied, or applied. How fast did they? Um, you know how much compression did you get? And then as you play around with it, you can see the differences very easily. And then a final um, uh, topic for restructuring of data is sometimes there's a limit to what you can do within a table. Sometimes you just have to change it to a different form. An obvious uh, um, example is where you're doing aggregations. So um, here we have an example here where we're taking, we're looking for canceled and delayed flights, and we're just aggregating them by um, the data flight and carrier. This, of course, uh, reduces the data enormously, puts it in a separate table, and in this particular case, it uh, reduced the the response time of this query by a factor of about 100. Uh, materialized views can can um, often reduce the query time by many orders of magnitude. Uh, we won't go further into that because we have a whole webinar on that, but it's a really great place to look as you're thinking about boosting performance after you've done optimizing the table. Restructuring the data in another table is a great way to, to boost it. And there's lots more things to think about. Smaller data types, the SDD compression, dictionaries, sampling. And of course, as your data gets larger than a single node, you begin to shard and replicate out to large data sets. That basically gives you more IOPS and, um, and the ability to, to ask questions across a much larger range of data. So that's it for... Um, uh, for restructuring your tables and um, and your data, the final thing I want to look at, and this is new in this webinar, is to think about storage and memory at the operating uh, system uh, level. So we've always thought about this, but there's a really interesting new feature in ClickHouse that you may not be aware of, and it's called storage policies. If you've been using ClickHouse for a while, you know that the basic way that ClickHouse works is that there's ClickHouse, there's amount somewhere that ClickHouse refers to, and all the data lives there. And of course, as we're reading and writing things, they go through the OS page cache. So um, generally, I mean, you can you can turn that on and off. There's there's tricks to do that. But generally speaking, if you, do, if you don't do anything, the pages as they're read in, in this case from a hard disk, they're going to be uh, cached in the, in the page cache. That's the way things were. As of uh, over the last few months, um, storage policies have arrived. They're now production ready, being used by many people. And what they allow you to do is begin to organize, first of all, have multiple disks. We call this a disk, but that's really just a storage mount point. It doesn't need to be a disk. Of course, it can be SSD. Or it can be NVMe SSD. It's just storage. And we can organize them. We can not only have a bunch of them, we can organize them into volumes. <coughs> so what we have right here is an example of a volume which contains four disks, and we call this a JBOD, so sort of just a bunch of disk storage pattern. What it's doing is it's basically going to increase our bandwidth by instead of scanning data across one disk and being dependent on the, the speed of the, the controller or, or, for example, our network uh, 
uh, access to that storage, we can now hopefully multiply it by four. And the effect can actually be pretty substantial. Um, oh, first of all, I should just show you how you do this. Um, of course, this is ClickHouse, so storage policies are defined in a configuration file. We won't go into that. It's pretty easy to look up, and we've talked about it in blog articles. But all you do is when you define the table, you just assign it a storage policy. If you say nothing, it will go into varlib ClickHouse data, as it usually does. Otherwise, it will go look in the storage policy. And in this particular case, I've given it uh, this EBS JBOD4 policy, which then points it to a volume with four disks. And what ClickHouse will do is it will um, basically spread the data across those disks, and the effect on query can be quite substantial. So here's a simple example. Um, if you use Amazon, you're probably aware that EBS has limited bandwidth per, uh, per volume that you allocate. But what we can do, what we show here, is that the, um, as we change the number of disks and run the same query, in the first case it takes two seconds, and then with two disks it already drops down to 0.6, and then, all, uh, then drops down to 0.443. So you might ask, hey, that's not linear. I mean, it's obviously not linear. You might ask, why is that? Uh, well, the, the answer is I don't quite know, because, but this is Amazon. There's, there's additional caching layers going on inside EBS, and the numbers kind of jump around. But in general, you can get really good um, improvements in performance. And this, if you're using um, EBS as opposed to local storage, for example, this is a way that, to increase your EBS bandwidth and get better performance. One other really interesting thing to note here is the um, is uh, the uh, effect of caching inside the OS uh, buffer cache. There's this really useful property, min bytes to use direct I.O. When I set it to one, that's just saying, hey, anything over one byte, I'm going to go straight to the storage device. I'm going to skip the buffer cache. But I can, get, um, I can use the buffer cache by setting that to zero, which is the default setting. And then when I run these, uh, these queries, what you see is it doesn't matter how many disks we have. In each case, the queries came back in exactly the same time, and they were faster because we were reading straight out of memory. So, um, so you want to think about, you can now think about how do you arrange disk, uh, or how do you arrange storage more accurately, and, how do you, um, and, and then how do you balance that against memory. These, these can have enormous effects on, on your response time. Um, once again, there's a system table that helps us track this. I won't go into this query, but basically if you ran this query on, for example, that four disk um, uh, example, it would, uh, it would show you that the, the data, is, the parts are evenly distributed across all devices. So this is one that you can select out. It's, it's a very useful query to, add, to, um, uh, to run. And the difference for people who have used this query before is there's now a column called disk name that shows you what disk your parts are living on. And then finally, um, this is just one example of how we can use storage by, by just adding more volumes. Uh, there's all, it's also possible now to do what's called tiered storage, where basically if you have time series data, most of your queries go on your most recent data. So your last 24 hours in a time series is often the place where 95% of the queries go. What you can do is you can arrange um, you can have a volume that is NVMe SSD. You can have another volume, which is a bunch of, of, of HDDs, so slow but high density, uh, uh, cheaper disk. And, um, and then you can use what are called TTLs to move the data between them. This is something that we've been working on for about the last, at this point, um, almost nine months. It's also production ready and uh, is being used by a number of, um, of, of sites. But this is, an, again, sort of an enormous uh, performance improvement that can give you very high-speed queries off your, um, uh, you know, off your most recent data, but allow you to store enormous volumes by, by having it automatically slide over to cheaper storage as time goes on. So this is a really cool um, feature, and I invite you to check it out. We have blog articles on it, and um, it's, it's in use now. And then at this point, since we're at the we're now at the operating system level. Um, it's always good to, you know, as you're thinking about the optimizations, there's just a boatload of great uh, 
OS utilities like IOSTAT when I was running these. I was, of course, running IOSTAT, just checking to make sure that I was writing on all spindles, that I didn't make a mistake. So uh, just to understand where the where the reads and writes are going. Um, Alexei Milovidov has a wonderful talk on this, uh, which is also given in the resources. Definitely check it out, and it, it'll it'll guide you to sort of low-level performance optimization. And with that, we're pretty much done. I see we have a boatload of questions, and Alexander has been really active. I'm just going to wrap up very quickly, and then we'll take questions for a while after that. Um, so uh, takeaways. So ClickHouse performance drivers, it's CPU and it's I.O. If you can, <clears throat> you know, apply more CPU and read less, you're going to do better on ClickHouse, generally speaking. Of course, if you have complex queries, at some point you get Amdahl effects, um, uh, but, uh, but these are the two drivers. And then with the, with the newer um, sort of volume management that's possible with storage policies, of course, we can add in, um, you know, changing your I.O. bandwidth, which will then allow you to, to get the data on and off more quickly. System query log is your friend. It's it's really great information, and the fact you can pull it back to clients, even uh, you know sort of API-driven clients, can also get this information. Huge, uh, a huge help when you're trying to diagnose what's going on. Um, you can tune queries just um, and improve response tr uh, substantially, as we saw from these examples. There, you know, can be on the order of uh, order of magnitude. Uh, but for really big changes, for multiple orders of magnitude, restructuring tables, adding indexes, adding map views, changing your encodings, that's the way to go. That's the biggest single area that, um, that you, can, you can get performance gains. And in fact, when we work with customers, that's a lot of where we spend because uh, you, can, you can do multiple iterations <coughs> excuse me, and, and get huge improvements. And then... In recent versions, so as of um, I think 19.17, the latest Alternity Stable, I don't have the number in front of me, but you can now begin to optimize storage using storage policies. And these will continue to the TTL uh, movement and other features that allow, us, allow that to get even better are, are in their increasingly stable. And um, 20.1 is, is approaching, version 20.1 is approaching uh, production readiness. We'll, probably declare victory there in a little while. Um, and so you have a panoply of features that you can use now to optimize storage. And there's a bunch of further resources. Check out our blog. Um, that's the multi-volume storage. I think that's one of the few places it's really documented in detail. Uh, we do a lot of performance, uh, but materialized views and then cluster performance are two webinars you can look at. Uh, ClickHouse documentation, of course, is great. Anything by Alexi is who's the lead uh, committer, of course, is uh, deserves special attention. His talks are wonderful. And then you can get help on ClickHouse, uh, Telegram, and Slack channel. And you can get help from us because that's our job. We offer services and uh, software to make people successful. So if you want to get dig deep into performance, that's what we're there for. We do this for a living, and we're really good at it. Um, if you have a performance question, uh, contact us. Uh, we offer free one-hour consultations to look at what you're, what you're doing, give you ideas. So feel free to take us up on that, and we'd be happy to help. This is our contact information. One final thing is we are hiring. So if you're a database internals or, or um, person or love uh, data services, uh, give us a yell. Send us your resume. We'd love to talk. And with that, I'm going to kick off the poll. I hope that you will take 15 seconds to just tick the boxes. And Alexander, if you want to just come on audio, we can go ahead and take some of the final questions, which I know you've been answering in the background. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, hi, hi, everybody. Thank you, Robert, so much for excellent uh, webinar. Uh, there was some very good questions um, in the background that I tried to answer. And few ones are unanswered. Uh, let me start with an answer first, so we can discuss them. And uh, I can turn to answer it and probably uh, illustrate some of them in more detail. So uh, regarding performance of updates, uh, the performance of alter updates depends on two things. First, it depends on your work condition, uh, because ClickHouse has to evaluate the work condition first. Uh, and using this work condition, 
it selects parts of the data that needs to be updated. And second one depends on the column, column size. So if you update in the column, which is huge, which has a lot of high cardinality of values, uh, then it might take longer comparing to column uh, that uh, just has a handful of values and is, uh, uh, is faster to read a comparison right back for that reason. So for uh, alter table update, click also on the touches those columns that needs to be updated, plus it executes filter condition. So if you understand uh, those concepts, you can guess what you can do uh, for performance. Uh, by the way, uh, updates are asynchronous, so you just uh, throw them out and wait for click house to, to finish uh, in the background, and you can always monitor what's going on. Um, regarding materialized use updates, it's, uh, it's interesting. So initially, all materialized use has been executed serially. Uh, so um, if you have multiple materialized use for the one table, uh, ClickHouse would execute one materialized view first, then the second one, and so on, in alphabetical order, which is kind of strange. But later on, uh, we, uh, we added uh, parallel processing. So now all materialized use are executed in parallel. Uh, given that there are enough, there is enough CPU power on the on the machine, and uh, written as soon as the data is uh, is available, so they executed in parallel, but uh, the completion may be uh, maybe not at the same amount of time. The problem, one of the problems in ClickHouse is materialized use execution is not atomic, so if there is any failure uh, with one of, with one of the views then some of views might be updated and others might be not. It doesn't happen too often, only if you have some problem with the data uh, write uh, or some, something like that. But if it does, you may have an inconsistent, inconsistent data. Uh, there are ways to deal with that. Uh, I think we discussed them uh, in the materialized views uh, webinar. Uh, but in general, this is a huge limitation in ClickHouse and we hope to fix it in the next, uh, the next few months. So the atomic update of materialized use is coming. Uh, this, the same about duplicates. So um, again, ClickHouse has a number of ways how you can deal with duplicates. If you have a replicated table, uh, it can automatically deduplicate the data given that you insert exactly the same data. Uh, another way is to use uh, replacing merge T uh, for, uh, for collapsing, for avoiding duplicates. Replacing merge T allows you to insert multiple versions of the data, and uh, then you can use uh, final modifier in queries, or you can optimize uh, the table. If you know, um, for, for example, if you insert the data in batches, you can insert a batch of data, and if you're sure that there are duplicates, you can optimize the table. It's not very fast operation, um, it's going to be improved soon, uh, but right now Optimize uh, is one is single threaded, which is slow. So it only works for small tables and small and click house means a million of, million of rows or single, single digit millions of rows. Um, the question from Chao regarding background operations. Uh, there are not too many logs in click house thanks to uh, insert only behavior. Uh, but um, there are certainly background operations that can slow down uh, the queries in general. Uh, the most obvious example is merge. So if uh, there are heavy merges are running, then uh, query uh, performance may degrade. Uh, and second is background moves that, are always, that also uh, consume uh, ClickHouse resources, uh, CPU and, and storage. Uh, so you, you, may, you may need to look into those and uh, manage uh, background pool size and move pool size in different uh, options around if you hit this problem. Uh, but ClickHouse constantly improves. So um, if you have some problems with log contentions right now, they may, uh, they may be uh, already fixed. So if, if there is something you're sure there's a problem, just fill the ticket on GitHub and we will try to look into uh, Regarding distributed queries, the question from Ralph. Um, 
uh, there is a setting that you should enable by uh, from the very beginning if you use distributed queries it's uh, it's called something like uh, distributed aggregation memory efficient or distributed group by memory efficient um, and uh, it allows clickhouse to use as little as little memory as possible without this setting clickhouse would pull all the data from the nodes first and then do aggregation on node initiator with this setting clickhouse would do it in small chunks uh, actually it's going to be enabled by default soon but for whatever reason it's still uh, disabled so you need to uh, turn it on explicitly um, next question the question from ian regarding the house operator so um, the cluster macro uh, this is a macro which is defined in macros xml file and if you use operator it automatically generates it if you need multiple clusters you actually uh, may you, you may use any cluster name here instead of a macro so it's not a requirement to use cluster macro it's just a convenience and if you have multiple cl clusters defined you just specify your cluster name and and that's it you don't need to use this macro if you don't need to <clears throat> so many good questions um the setting. we can keep going for a few more minutes alexander these questions are awesome yeah, uh, I see uh, a lot of repeated questions from memory settings. Uh, uh, while I answering the question from Timur, uh, Robert, you can look for the setting. It should be in uh, your cluster performance webinar. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, there, the, the question from Timur regarding uh, storing just a part of the data. Okay, so if you want to store uh, the tweet and the history, uh, you can uh, use, right, you can use uh, uh, your history table and uh, materialize you with replacing NOSHT for your uh, latest state uh, table, let's put it this way. Uh, in this case, you can just insert your historical, once you have an update, you just insert a record to your uh, source table and materialize you would, uh, propagate this update to uh, replacing NOSHT and from replacing NOSHT you can always get uh, the latest uh, the latest role. There are some other view, other ways to achieve uh, the, the same behavior. Uh, there is an article in our blog uh, regarding uh, on a similar topic. Um, it's called something like how you can do real-time updates in ClickHouse and uh, you can get some ideas from this. The right ahead log for um, compact parts. Actually, I'm not sure about this particular feature. Probably um, I don't understand the question completely. What is common is polymorphic parts in NERSTI. With polymorphic parts, uh, this, is, uh, this is a new feature that allow you to do frequent inserts. So as you know, right now, uh, every insert is um, generates a lot of data in ClickHouse uh, because uh, when you have multiple columns, every column uh, contain, is stored in at least two files. So if you insert uh, you know, one row, it will generate uh, 200 files for your uh, 100 columns table. So this is very inefficient. So that's why we uh, usually recommend to insert in a big chunks of data so ClickHouse can uh, do an efficient job of storing it. Uh, but sometimes you need to insert frequently in small chunks uh, and uh, you know that there is a buffer table but it's not very convenient to use and you can lose it because it's in memory only so what is coming is polymorphic part uh, with polymorphic part feature uh, clickhouse would be able to store a small small inserts in a row based format not in a column store but in a single rows and uh, then uh, once it has enough data in the raw format, it can merge it uh, to the columnar format using, uh, during the merge process. That will allow to do smaller inserts. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, the question about max bytes before external group by from Luciana. Uh, 
Um, and sometimes it seems that option is not used. Uh, actually, there are different uh, reasons that you can get out of memory. It's not just uh, um, because you, uh, you cannot group by the data. Uh, could be some different reasons. Uh, actually, sometimes it's even not possible to spill to disk. For example, if you're calculating Unix, uh, query with Unix, uh, then uh, ClickHouse cannot spill to disk the partial result. You, it needs to store everything in memory. Um, otherwise, um, you cannot do correct calculation. But for uh, simple queries with uh, simple aggregations and sums um, and groupings, uh, it, sh it should work. Uh, what we typically recommend is to set this setting at least half of uh, the memory that you allocate to ClickHouse in general. So don't set it too much. Uh, probably it's better to set it lower so ClickHouse can start spilling uh, earlier, um, not filling all your available memory. Robert, have you, ha have you had a chance to look for the query setting that we discussed? Yes, it's distributed aggregation memory efficient. If you look at your screen, you, I should be sharing. I hope I am still. No, you're sharing. I think that's the one you meant. You're sharing the different screen, wrong screen. Oh, am I? Okay, yeah. here, let me just double. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let me just reshare. I also posted it in. Uh, all right, desktop one, you should see it. There you go. So, yeah, so that was a, um, yeah, so, the, and this is a great example of how the, the system tables are just incredibly easy to use. Um, I just went and looked for things like distributed and looked down, and they have, of course, the definitions. Um, Alexander, we are well over time, so I think we probably will uh, call it a day. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for filling out the poll. I am thinking that there there is a, a call to do a webinar on arrays. We'll definitely consider that. That one's been on my list for a long time because I'd like to understand them. And I'm thinking that we'll do another thing just based on these questions. We're thinking about doing um, an online office hours, uh, which we may sort of do at intervals, which would allow you just to come on and ask these kinds of questions. Uh, it'd be a great way to, uh, to get people together and, and learn more about ClickHouse. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll be posting that. You'll see the uh, recording on this uh, sent out to you in a link as well as the slides. And Alexander, thank you so much for answering these questions. Thank you for questions. Those are very good ones. Yeah, it was. We had some good good readers make a good book, and good questioners make for a good webinar. So, thank you very much, everybody. Hope you have a great day. Please feel free to contact us if you have additional questions. We'd be happy to do that one-hour consultation and dig deeper into your use cases. Thanks, and have a wonderful day. Bye.